Welcome everyone today for our uh, webinar with Annie Circus. We've got uh, 97 at the moment, we've got 300 books, so uh, people uh, will hopefully uh, join us later on, uh, or they're probably trying to work out how to how to use the, the system for the first time. Um, but I'm really, really excited um, to have Andy uh, with us today, uh, actor, writer and director, uh, and we're hosting this webinar with the National Youth Film Academy and obviously my, myself, uh, Rob Earnshaw. Um, now, Andy, I know you, you, you don't need any introduction, but just just for those who, uh, very few who I, probably everyone knows everything about Andy anyway beforehand, but uh, uh, obviously Andy started out at uh, Lancaster University where he, he got into student theatre. Uh, since then Andy's gone on to play leading roles in Peter Jackson's Lord of the Rings, Black Panther, King Kong, and he's since moved into, directly, uh, into directing uh, most recently uh, Mowgli's Legend of the Jungle on Netflix, which uh, if you haven't seen yet, it is absolutely brilliant. Uh, and also his son, uh, Louis, starring in that as well. Um, uh, also, as well as Andy, we've got our amazing National Youth Film Academy members, all of whom are aged 16 to 25 and are, are driven, yes, are really driven to, to be working in uh, a fil in film like I'm, I'm sure yourself uh, were back in the day, Andy, when you uh, when you first started out. Um, um, but not only I'm really excited that we've got Andy because of his talents in film and obviously his, his huge reputation, but as I said, um, Andy's got uh, Andy's got some children, and two of them work in in film as well. So uh, Sonny and Louis work in film. So no doubt, Andy, you're quite well practiced at advising young filmmakers and actors on the film industry and and how to get into this. Yeah, I'm <laughs> that very same question. <laughs> sure there was. <laughs> Brilliant. So the way that the session is going to work is uh, for everyone out there is we'll ask Andy some questions that you guys have already sent across to us. Um, and then as we go along, you can ask some questions in the chat box uh, and we'll just uh, have a have a chat for about an hour or so. So um, if you're ready, Andy, are we ready to say we're ready to go. Um, brilliant. So. Brilliant. I'm, I'm sure. I mean, you've done loads of talk shows before and think things like this. And, uh, and and I know everybody always asks you about your your acting and obviously specific characters that you've played. But I'm really interested to find out about yourself and your journey and how you got into film because a lot of these young people, um, obviously, everyone's got a different story, and it's always interesting to see how people start. Um, now, now I know that you're born in London and. Quite interesting. Your, your father was a medical doctor working in Iran, and uh, obviously your mother was a special education uh, needs teacher. What, so, what was it like growing up, and how on earth did you end up falling in love with this industry and, and the industry that you're working now? Uh, that's a good question. Um, so, yeah, so my father is Iraqi, and he he lived in Baghdad, and so as a child, I sort of split was split sort of time wise between uh, going and visit him in the summer holidays um, we all used to go over to all my family the whole family used to go and visit Baghdad and I uh, had lots of cousins over there and then and then we'd come back and that for the most of the year we'd be we'd be in England my mum as you say was a special needs uh, teacher um, mm -hmm. I three older sisters and a young brother and we, we we lived in West London and I was from a very very early age fascinated with uh, visual arts so I, I really wanted to paint and I spent a lot of my time, sort of, well, split my time between painting and and uh, and climbing, which was my other hobby. Uh, so I used to do a lot of mountaineering. Um, those are my two things, which led me to Lancaster University because it's very near the Lake District, and it also had a brilliant visual arts course. So it was a fantastic kind of combination and a great starting place for me. Um, mm -hmm. uh, in fact, I chose I actually chose Lancaster because probably more because it was near the Lake District and I could go <laughs> climb. Um, so, um, but when I arrived there, I, what I didn't realize is that uh, I, hadn't, I hadn't even thought about it. I thought I was going to be just concentrating on visual arts and I was specifically interested in graphic design and, uh, um, you know, that, that side of things, as well as fine art and painting. Um, but, but you had to do another uh, course in the first year and I had no idea what, at all what I was going to do for this third course. And then in sort of the freshers week of it all, I, I discovered that there was a very good theatre studies department and I was reasonably interested in theatre, I'd done a few school plays and stuff. Um, and so I started to get involved with, you know, that I made that the third part of my degree, this theatre studies module, and um, I started to design uh, posters for their shows, for the productions that were going on, and, uh, and, and then sets, and it sort of fitted into the visual arts side of what I was there to, supposed to be doing in the first place, um, you know, very neatly. And then gradually, but people were asking me to to be in the show. So I started acting, I had small roles and they gradually got bigger. And then by the end of the first year, I did a play uh, by an author called uh, Barry Keefe in the 
place mm -hmm. got you. And it was a much extraordinary piece of writing and it was the central role and and I managed to work with a young student director at the time who, who introduced me to the whole Stanislavskian method of acting and by the, literally by the end of that production and which coincided at the end of my first year I decided to put the paintbrushes and the easel away and uh, and, and decided to become an actor and uh, I remember making the call to my parents and then just not saying anything at all because they were horrified enough with me going up to be an artist but then when I went up there and came back after my first year wanted to be an actor they were doubly horrified um well, so, iranian culture, sorry because iranian culture doesn't really fit into the uh, like especially at the time when you were growing up i can imagine it was uh well, it, quite it, yeah, it wasn't considered a proper job put it that way <laughs> <laughs> so um yeah so it was uh so it was interesting um but it was good because it gave me something to kind of uh to, to really fight for and to fight you know to fight against in a way you know yeah. um, uh, so, so, so I spent, so I spent really the next. So, I, what you could do at Lancaster University, fortunately, you were able to do this thing called an independent studies degree. And so, I changed my whole course from uh, from the visual arts thing to to um, what a self designed course called. It was called independent studies in theatre design and right. theatre design and movement. And it, so it was It was a combination of the of making and creating and performing. And so I, I found my own tutors. Found um, you know they built it was built up over lots of different modules, and I found different um, performance experts, dancers, mime artists. Uh, worked with theatre designers in regional in the regional theatre in the Duke's Playhouse, and um, and then by the end of my three years there, um, I was very fortunate enough. In those days, when when you started out in theatre, you had to have what was called an equity card. You still have to have an equity card. <laughs> card but but it's much easier to get into the business now but in those days they were literally giving out two per theater per year and I was lucky enough to get an equity card and I was and I was blown away and and, and I started my career um, at the Duke's Playhouse um, which is an amazing theater there which had a really wonderful director who was very um, community orientated and I, I did 14 plays back to back during so I really learned on the job I was fortunate enough to to uh, to really learn on the job, and I did everything from um, Shakespeare to Brecht to um, modern playwrights to you know Edward Bond to um, Sondheim to you know pantomimes. To, so you know, and, and all the all the time it was it was uh, rehearsing during the day and performing at night. So it enabled you to create this have to create uh, different characters and and work on characterization in a very immediate way because um, people coming you know the, the, the with regional theatres you've got the same audience coming back and one week they'll see you as I don't know, Iago in Othello and the next week they'll see they'll see you in, in, in a musical or, or something like that so it's so it was a very it was a fantastic um, stepping off point and um, which I'm really glad to have uh, had that opportunity and experience and and, and and just one more thing about that place the Duke's Playhouse Jonathan Petherbridge who was the director there as I say, was very community orientated, and, and and I feel incredibly lucky because I think when you go into performing arts or to go into you know into into the art world, or performing film making, whatever you know, it, it, what he instilled in me was very much a, a sense, and in the company actually, the whole company was a, a sense of why you do what you do, and that you know really challenged what it means to be in the business and what it what your job is and not you know beyond the craft of acting your job is there to, to provide a service to to go out and research characters and work on them and develop them and then come back and and share them with the audience so it's very much about serving the community and 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 really that goes back to very early forms of storytelling because because mm. obviously shame and and as early storytellers were providing a service to that community, so he, he really had that belief, and and it's given me a lifelong uh, purpose, I suppose, in terms of in terms of the sorts of projects I choose and what I what I want to do and the stories I want to tell. Because you mentioned Jonathan quite a lot, and a lot of things I've read about yourself, he seemed almost like a, a mentor, or he was almost like an apprenticeship taking you under his wing. Is that is that something that you think that really helped you having a mentor to be able to turn to? Very much so. I mean. Uh, the, you know that experience of working within a company. I mean, I also learned from all, all the other actors and uh, and 
who worked on the crew and and just being part of a theatre, being part of an, an entity that that was connected to its community in a big way. Um, but yeah, Jonathan uh, Petherbridge was was truly had that belief and. Um, he, he then left and went on to another theatre company called The Bubble, in The London Bubble, and mm -hmm. he was also a follower of a theatre practitioner called Augusto Boal, who, who uh, wrote a book called Theatre of the Oppressed. And Theatre of the Oppressed is about, again, it's a different, it's a, he, he created theatre that involves the community in a much more direct way. This is a Brazilian, uh, sorry, Argentinian uh, theatre director in the 70s who started a thing called Forum Theatre, Forum being you go into a community, you talk about the issues in that community, and then um, you, you create a play with with, uh, with with everybody you know who turns up to be in it. And then the audience watch the play, and they're not just spectators. What he calls them are spect actors. So they can basically put their hands up and say and stop the play and take the part of the pr protagonist and sort of by virtue of the fact all the community are working out the, the, the problems that they are investigating. <laughs> Plays, they they arrive at a solution, so so it's a very it was it, that sort of has really informed uh, I suppose my approach to acting and and, and telling a story on a, 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 a how you connect with an audience, and that's been very very uh, instrumental and important in, um, in, in yeah as I say in, in everything that I've done. So you started out. Uh you want to go and climb in the Lake District. <laughs> you went and discovered your your love for the mechanics of theatre at university in, in Lancaster. At that time, when you at a young age, did you ever think in your wildest dreams that you'd become one of the world's uh, most renowned motion capture uh, artists and 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 and, and person with the well, just I mean, a huge reputation that you do. It must have, looking back. I, no, I mean, of course, you you, don't, you you have no idea what what lies ahead. Um, from, from Lancaster, I started working in, you know, I had a big, long theatre career, um, which span, which really went from 1987 to 2002. Um, and that was the last time I'd been on stage, actually. Uh, so, and, 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 and during that time, kind of worked a lot of different theatres, regional theatres, and then moved back to London and, uh, and then, you know, performed on stage all, all over London, uh, doing, again, lots of different things. And... I, and then started to work in television and then film, did a lot of British independent movies. Um, during that time, I always knew that I wanted to write and direct and uh, create and make. And I think that, that, again, it's that sense of what that early experience for me what was about. What was that sort of, you know, if you're not getting employed as an actor, then then write your own material. Or if you're not, if, if you're not, if someone's not giving you a job, then make something yourself. It was very much a an ethos that I that I had, you know, had. Um, I mean, I was for, I was fortunate enough to, to, to pretty well keep in employment, but at the same in those early years. But at the same time, I I I, I was just kind of inspired to to create and make my my own stuff. And I just think that's that's one of the greatest. Things that that, uh, that that was passed on to me, and, and advice that was passed on to me, and and, I, and that I try to when I talk to people, I try and infuse them to do, which is which is always be, be uh, you know have a story to tell, you know cre cre have something that you want to create, that you want to communicate, find something that, that drives you, that it, that you're passionate about to do. Um, so so throughout all those early years in theatre, that that was sort of fermenting away um, the desire to, to to direct and tell stories. Um, of ideas that that and, and in fact one of the projects is um, that that we're working on now is something that 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 I started in my mind's eye 25 30 years ago so so it's they, they, those, there's nothing wasted they're all it's all grist to the mill all those things all those ideas that you have uh, mm -hmm. can hopefully eventually find a way to, to to come out but you had absolutely no um, connections when you first started out. It must have been quite difficult. I mean, obviously, I'm sure a lot of our young members will relate to this. What sort of sort of barriers barriers to entry did you have trying to to get into the industry? Well, I, I mean, as I say, that I, I was very fortunate enough to get that equity card. And had I not, I mean, then that would have meant a lot of um, you have to build up hours. At that time, when the union was very strong, and you couldn't literally couldn't be an actor until you could join the union. Um, that that was that was more it was a more it was more difficult in a sense. I mean, I think I think nowadays there there are lots of portals in, through which you can go to enter into uh, 
a, a career in in you know in filmmaking or, or the arts because because obviously the internet has sort of opened up lots of ways of learning and expressing and you know with Gar everything from garage band to, to sculpting with zbrush to sculpting with, you know it, there's a whole there's and, and sharing and being able to literally have you know make short films and put them up and, and get them seen I think there's there's far more um, you know there's far more um, accessibility now than there ever was when I, when I when I started out but having having said that of course there's more people doing it so so that's so to get it, so to have your uh, work uh, noticed and seen, there's a lot more competition. So I think that you know it is a slightly different. You know, it is a different time, and it, but and there are challenges in the world, well, the one that I grew up in, and, and, yeah. and now. So um, I mean, I think I think it, it really, it, as I say, I, I think I think the key to it is self-created work. And then with crowdfunding and, and all of and all of that, um, uh, all of the possibilities there, you can certainly, you know, get a foot in the door and get things up and running. But don't don't wait. You I think wait, wait to yeah. be the answer. And you mentioned challenges. I mean, what has been, would you say, the most challenging part of your career to date? What, how, uh, yeah, what, what's been the most challenging part? Yeah. Um, there are so many, so many challenges along the way because you're. But, but I suppose, you know, one of the big challenges is not to judge yourself against other people. I think you're just just you are creating your own path. And and I think as soon as you start to sort of look at other people and other people's work and other people's uh, careers and start, you know, thinking, well, I should be there or I should be doing that or he's doing or she's doing better than me or, you know, that's a bit of a slippery slope. And it's very important to 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 think of it as a collaborative uh, exercise and, and not a, a competitive exercise. You know, the, the, this is an industry that, you know, presumably everybody who's watching today, uh, you know, you, you want to be here because you, you enjoy being part of a process and, and that the collaboration is, is equally as, as important as, um, you know, getting your point of view or your story or, you know, whatever, whatever part of the machine that you are in, in the creation of, of, a, of a movie or a, or a documentary or you know, a story a piece of theatre, whatever it is, um, you are you're part of a team and that, that's really, really important to remember. So, so um, what are the challenges? The challenges are um, keeping faith when things mm -hmm. aren't going your way um, and, and, just, and, and just really trusting your instinct, I think. And even when it gets knocked off, of course, and you and you think and you and you find yourself maybe not you know, not listening to your gut instinct, it's really important to remember you know why you want to do this and and, and what's your ultimate objective? What are you, what are you? Why are you in this business? Or what what do you want out of this business? It's I think it really is important to to know that. Um, so, so why, uh, would you, why would you say you, you what motivates you? Why are you in this business, then, Andy? What 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 keeps you going when when maybe faith is being? I think I think I've I mean I've I've always tended to uh, want to tell stories on the whole about or got involved with or played characters who are outsiders or mm -hmm. who perhaps don't quite fit in or uh, there's a sense of I, I suppose a sense of you know fighting for the un, for the underdog I, I, you know I've always gravitated towards stories which are about people who who are over, trying to overcome something significant, or whether it's a personal demon, or whether it's you know something out there. It, it's so it's 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 very much about um, yeah. I think I think that goes for you know a lot of the characters that I've played. Who have, you know when I, when I think about it, there's been a, a fair few characters I've played, played that are marginalised, that are outsiders, um, other in some way. Um, but it must be difficult. Um, obviously, you face challenges whilst trying to get into the industry, but also when when you are in the industry, I mean, you spent, was it two years you spent with Peter out in New Zealand uh, playing Gollum twice? Once uh, you had to play him when you were, when he was as, a, as, a, as an actor, but also for CGI. I mean, that must be pretty difficult being away from your family for two years, or difficult actually for your family as well, surely. To... Very, very much so. I mean, but, um, for the, I mean New Zealand was, a, was a, so, so sort of just to, to do the catch up in between, I, I sort of, up until 2000, and up until 1999. In fact, this year is is going to be the 20th anniversary of when we started shooting Lord of the Rings. I can't believe it's gone by. I, I 
<laughs> making me feel old. <laughs> um, but but yeah, sort of in the years leading up to that, I'd work with with directors like Mike Lee and um, uh, who else? Uh, you know, a whole bunch of really good British directors uh, and really thought that that was that would be it really I, would, I, would, I, I didn't anticipate at all a sort of a journey across the pond going to work in the states uh, or anything like that and and then I, and then I was fortunate enough to get a, um, an audition for for Lord of the Rings and again and it's rather like it's almost rather like uh, me going to Lancaster and thinking I was going to be an artist and 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 coming out an actor uh, when I went to to audition for Lord of the Rings I was told that the first thing I was told about the job by my agent was was that it was a, a, a voice role that right. it was a, a digital character this is remember this is 20 years ago and, and really the only measure of a, a kind of a, a digital character that um, that I'd really seen at all was um, Jar Jar Binks and and uh, you know or knew about you know and that was that was not terribly well received and it was in its such in its early days and what Peter Jackson was doing was was actually groundbreaking in the sense that it was the first time um, an, a, an emotionally driven uh, uh, character was 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 approached from it from the role of it being a performance rather than it being a visual effect mm. and so I when I when I got the part um, you know, and I thought well, at first, and I, I was quite reticent about about it. It was just like when I literally, when my agent said, you know, you, we, you've got an audition for Lord of the Rings, I, I said, well, what is it for? And they said this voiceover thing. I said, well, can't you get me up for a decent part? You know, there must be loads <laughs> of good acting roles in that. Well, I don't want to do a voice for a digital character. And uh, again, this sort of adjacent promise landed on my lap, which was when I went to meet Peter, who said, no, we want an actor to play Gollum. Uh, we want someone to 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 embody him, to be on set, to act with the other actors, because up until that point, it had been, you know, actors working against the tennis ball on a stick, pretending something was there, and not engaging with it. And and Gollum is so significant in in the, in the scenes; he's driving a lot of them. He, he forces a wedge between Sam Samwise and, uh, and and Frodo, and he you know he drives a lot of the scenes. So so we want an actor to play the role. But finally, because we can't have an actor. You couldn't possibly play him because you're not thin enough. The way that he's been designed, he's such an emaciated thing. But but so so th so so he said. When we, and there's this thing called motion capture which we're experimenting with. And um, so I thought, okay, well, uh, look, okay. I mean, I, I was very inspired by him as soon as I met him and his mm -hmm. wife Fran Walsh. She was one of the co-writers. Um, so we we so I went up there and uh, or went you know accepted the job and flew over to New Zealand and it was it was a huge departure and you know it, the technology evolved around the performance around you know I, I just treated it as any normal character that I was playing I got I, I found a physicality and, and, and a, a, you know a backstory and an emotion and, and emotionally centered the character around the notion of addiction and you know that the ring was as powerful as any 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 you know Powerful drug that that affects someone physically and so on and so forth, and and it, and just went down the normal route of pr preparing for a character, um, and then you know found myself on the first day of filming, six thousand feet up a mountain with a film crew, with me in this skimpy you know, <laughs> crawling about as God, and uh, and, <laughs> and Peter Jackson laughing at me and uh, wondering, you know, and then and then watching, and then as soon as he was watching what I was doing. He said he sort of changed his whole approach and just went, okay, we're going to film Andy. We're going to film Andy's performance. They redesigned the character so that it would fit my facial uh, facial structure. That Gollum's facial features would exactly be my features, and they re they redesigned the whole character so it would look like me. That doesn't look exactly like me, of course. I'm fine. <laughs> but, um, but actually, when I saw the sculpt of of the of the character it was going to be uh, that was going to be in the in the movie, it looked it actually did look like my dad. Funnily enough, oh. <laughs> um, does he know so that? He's... I now know that in the next twenty or thirty years' time, I'm going to increasingly look more and more like Gollum. Um, right. <laughs> um, Hopefully, but, not but... your Theresa May's uh, version of Gollum. <laughs> <laughs> that was great. Um, was scary. Um, so, so that that was that was the beginning. But that was the beginning of uh, shooting on set, and that we shot the three films, as pe many people will know from watching behind the scenes, if they have. Yeah. Um, we shot the three films. 
together. And then, and then with each year, so with it, as they were released, we went back and did pickups, and then I went back and did sort of motion capture uh, pickups. And at th that time, it was called motion capture, not performance capture, and it's called performance capture now because at that time, the animators were animating my facial expressions rather than using facial capture. And that uh, that that was that really came with King Kong, the next film that I did with Peter, where it, that, that I was wearing dots on my face, and 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 the cameras were filming my facial performance and my facial performance was driving the digital avatar of Kong and that was so that then becomes full performance capture when you're capturing audio physicality and, and facial but at the time on Lord of the Rings the early days it was it was just the physical capture and then animators would animate my face so so it went through this whole journey of, of, of this evolution and I found myself straddling between two worlds, the worlds of performers and actors and being on set and acting and then talking to animators and visual effects artists and talking through each shot with animators and, and suddenly suddenly I found myself in the, you know armed with this whole other um, range of skills I suppose which then sort of were, were backing up my desires to direct. Peter Jackson knew I wanted to direct and uh, had seen some short films that I'd made and 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 then he asked me when we came back to do the Hobbit the Hobbit trilogy he asked me to direct the second unit on the Hobbit um, which was an incredible experience and uh, we, you know and I, there was me thinking my first film was really going to be maybe three or four actors in two locations with a, a couple of cameras and I suddenly found myself in front of a crew of 250 people halfway up a mountain, you know, shooting in 3D at 48 frames a second for 200 days and, uh, you know, the equivalent of five movies. Um, it was the most extraordinary learning curve and and that, tr that Peter trusted me to do that was quite phenomenal. But it gave me, it gave me a huge, obviously a huge, um, a, a, a huge amount of experience to be able to cope with anything, I suppose. Well, that's really interesting because you mentioned um, when you were speaking there about the relationship you had with your agent and you were comfortable enough to say, what on earth, what on earth is this all about? And then you, you built a great relationship with your director on set as well. And, and, and actually from that relationship, a career has blossomed. I mean, how important is it to, to build relationships in this industry and, and how has it helped you uh, sort of get into where you are today? I mean, you... you you have to choose who you build your your relationship with. Um, and, and it's not, you know, Peter and Fran and the whole experience of working in New Zealand and everyone on the cast and crew there were, were it was such a tight unit. And Peter's a, an extraordinarily um, generous director. And not all directors are like that. You know, they just don't operate in that way. Some are very, you know, keep the film close to their chest and they're, they, they, they um, you know, they're, they're very private about the way and they don't want, they, they don't have the space for that. But Peter's the opposite. He wanted to, I mean, even in the way he shared the the, the, the films with the fans. I mean, he was a real forerunner of of uh, of, of, of promoting on the, using the internet. I mean, the blogs that he used to do, the, the the behind the scenes that he used to share whilst the filmmaking was going on was relatively groundbreaking. I mean, it hadn't been done before. Everyone everyone had kept it very close, you know, close to themselves. It was a secret. The filmmaking process was very secret. Peter shared everything, and 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 that. So I was very very lucky again to to work with a, a mentor who. Who had that generosity and compassion and, and the desire to include and listen and value people's opinions and, and so on and so forth. And I think if you get to, you know, that's what I mean about choosing your mentor. You know, when you meet people like that, you know, you, you, you feel very lucky. You feel very lucky. Because it's it's interesting. I've I've been fortunate enough to speak to you today, and we we, we met briefly at a, uh, at the Newport uh, Awards, and uh, and also I've been fortunate enough through the National Youth Film Academy to meet people such as yourself, high caliber in the industry. And what what I find quite a lot is a lot of young people, especially especially young people, all think that the industry is a, a backstabbing industry. They think it's full of horrible people. But from my experience, everybody that we've met who are at the top, such as yourself, are just genuine nice people who want to work. And, and have fun doing it. I mean, has your experience? Have you ever had that backstabbing uh, moment, or is, uh, or what, what's your experience about working with people um, in the industry? You know, oh, look, every every industry. It, you, you can't separate this industry from any other industry. Everyone has good or bad days. You know, there are people who operate in uh, not particularly uh, good and healthy and uh, lead with you know 
a healthy lead with healthy leadership and good leadership. There are some people who are downright awful. There are people who don't listen. There there are people who manipulate. There, but you know, in any industry. Um, so, I, but but my experience is on the whole that there's a passion in within the filmmaking industry which is all centered around you know the story that you're telling. And for the most part, I have to say. There's very few. I can't think of that many people who, are, you know, I would cross the street to avoid in the, in the, the, <laughs> the years or whatever that I've been. How long? Yeah, Thirty years, thirty-two years I've been doing this job. Um, you know, there's very few. I mean, literally on 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 one hand, can I count the people who I, I would actively, you know, not want to work with again, or, or you know, because 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 people are here because they again going back to what I was saying earlier, they want to share, they want to have a shared experience of creating mm -hmm. something. Which is going to transport people, which is going to really affect. I mean, I think it's it, again, it's really important to understand the the impact of what we do and mm -hmm. the fact that I, I've sort of recently, in fact, you were there that night. Um, do yeah. you remember Medi, Medi Cinema, who are an organisation, oh, a charity, which we're now just to let you know we've we've just partnered with them to donate one percent of all our money to Medi Cinema. It's a great, great, great charity, and I'm I'm so glad you mentioned it. So, so sorry, Medi Cinema. Yes, no, no. I've recently become an ambassador for them because I really was was uh, um, moved by by what they have to offer, and and you'll you know everybody you'll be you'll be aware of what they offer now. But but it's things like that. It's 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 that idea that you are very intimately connecting with people when you make a, a film, when you're, you know, creating a TV show or whatever it is, documentary, you know, to have that moment of sitting down with the audience, uh, with other people and cathartically go through an experience, but p p singularly walk in the shoes and empathize with a character or a story. Um, it, it's an extraordinary thing to offer people, to, to offer people and to, and to certainly in the medicinema, um, the way that was explained, you know, to create some normality for people who are in this terrible situation of being in hospital or their children are in hospital or their parents or, you know, that, you know, some people are watching their first ever film. Some people are maybe watching their last ever film and you're taking them into this extraordinary world. And for those two hours, you're transporting them. You're literally transporting them, and that's an incredible power to have, you know, and to be privileged enough to to be part of. So, so I, I do think, you know, I do think we are in an industry that is very that has a high level of um, altruism and uh, um, yeah, kind of offers possibility and hope. Obviously. Within that, there are egos. Obviously, you know, with every any in any job, um, and some people think that their opinion is more important or valuable than someone else's. You get that in any job, and that's that's. I think the biggest thing I learned. So the biggest thing I've learned as a director, I think, is um, I th when I started out, I, I, I felt you feel like you have to know everything. You feel like you have to. Uh, have an answer for everything you have to be and, and and you know it's like you do you get asked a million questions as a director but you also have a great team and 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 directing is all about um allowing the team to do or creating an atmosphere for everyone in that team to do their best work whether it's you know if you if you if you you know if you have a, a grip who is really into the story then they're going to make that shot work fantastically well when that slow push in, push in. If they're engrossed in the story and the character in this particular moment that they're absolutely in, they're going to do they're going to do their best ever grip work pushing that camera in. Um, if you if you're a director who's like yeah come on everybody get a move on you know we're late we've got to you know and and people are sort of watching their you know looking at their phones or what whatever then then they're not engaged and it's. So, the, so it's all about, you know, as a, as, a, as a certainly as a director, it's about valuing people's input and allowing them to feel like they're as, as, you know, as important and creative and and are telling the story on an equal level. As far as I can tell, that's 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 my approach, um, and that's what I've learned. And again, Peter Jackson was very informative in that way. And that's really interesting because that shows real, true leadership qualities. And I think uh, uh, whether you're the director or whether you're uh, working as a, as a runner, I think if everybody's engaged in a story, you're going to get the best out of it. And let's be honest, I think people forget that 
this is the film industry it's a place of work and you want to enjoy coming to work and uh, it's brilliant to have uh, uh, people like yourself <laughs> sort of showing that actually you, you can have a team and enjoy working on set and uh, and, and just have, have fun t telling stories which is great. Um, right we've got um, a number of questions from uh, some of our members who've um, We've asked uh, a couple of things here. So um, if you don't mind, I'm just going to ask you some, uh, some yeah, questions cool. that are thrown out. Um, so, um, right, we've got a question here from Sumay Ahmed, and it says, uh, is it possible to do well to succeed without going to drama school? It's a question we hear all the time. Is it possible to succeed without going to drama school? Well, I, I didn't go to drama school, as you've, as you've heard. You know, I did, I, you know, and no, uh, the, answer, the short answer is, of course you can succeed. Um, yeah. A natural talent does, you know, if you, as long as you find an avenue for it to come out. Dra what drama school does, I mean, if you, drama school is good in the sense that from a business point of view, I mean, of course you learn craft, you learn, and you have experiences like, you know, you learn movement and you learn how to sword fight, you learn scene, you do scenes, you, you, you work, you work with camera, you do, you do learn craft, you know, you learn how to act on stage and, and stage craft. But you can you can also, as I did, you can learn that on the job, um, and and particularly if you're making your own stuff, and you you know, I mean, there's there are so many, as I say, the, the the ways into acting are a lot a lot a lot more varied and diverse now. You don't you don't definitely don't have to go to drama school. What drama school does give you is, um, at the end of the three years or two years or whatever the length of the course is, it, it does give you a platform in terms of access to agents because they do showcases and they do you know. Uh, all of that maybe that gives you a slight edge I don't know um, but but no there are so many very successful actors who who have never been anywhere near a drama school um, and have found their way you know into it by playing small roles or or running and then getting onto it you know just, just literally finding their way into it uh, being stand-ins or, or uh, doing amateur theater or you know and then gradually you just need to get that first break and then and then you're on your way uh, and that, that sort of leads me on to the next thing about the agent. So we've got quite a few questions here about how do you get an agent, but actually, um, how as a director, what are you looking for in an in an actor, and how do you go about finding and, and casting uh, casting actors? So, uh, in terms of the question, so uh, if you could answer in terms of how could an actor do their best to be noticed by a director like yourself, and likewise, how what what should a director be looking for in their performers? I mean, I think I think what. Auditions are horrendous things. They are just nightmare situations because everyone's nervous. You know, you've, you've given a script, you know, a handful of script pages to learn, and and you're, you're meeting, walking into this environment which is very alien and, and isn't conducive to, um, you know, to creativity really. Um, so from from an actor's from an actor's point of view, um, it's really uh, I I important to feel to, to to know this that actually. People want you to be the person walking through that door to be that character. You know, a casting director, a director, and producer who are sitting there watching you, they're really waiting for you to be that person. So that's one thing. The second thing is, uh, so don't go in there thinking they're the enemy. You know, go in there thinking, you know, I've got as much right to be here and I could be right for this role. And if I don't get it, it's, it's maybe not because because I'm, I, I didn't do well. It's not about doing well. It's about, you know, the choices when, you, when you're directing, it's like there are so many factors involved in, in actually, have, you know, seeing that person going, that's the, that's the right person. And that involves, you know, chemistry within the rest of the casting. Um, it, it's, uh, you, know, how, how, you know, does that person take direction? I mean, that's an, that's an interesting one. Because you, you know, normally you get two or three goes at a, at a piece. And... I think if you can show that you can really take direction and not have an idea of the character that's totally fixed in your mind and that's unshakable, I think directors definitely, and I certainly like to see in, when I work with actors in, in audition situations, that um, that they are they are really listening and in the moment and and and, and able to, to take direction to a great degree. Um, so yeah. attitude. So if you had a great actor in front of you and then they maybe didn't demonstrate the right attitude um, what what sort of what sort of attitude are you looking for in your performance outside of their acting ability i mean obviously taking direction being one of them but yeah i mean it's not i mean again auditions are so horrifically short and uh, <laughs> uh, 
you know, there's only a certain amount of time to establish a relationship with with, with someone, and you know, it's a bit, it's a, it's a, it's a kind of high risk part of the process because, you know, this person might be not right. I mean, it might not be right, but but you've got a hunch or there's something. Again, it's a lot of it's down to instinct, um, I, but it is down to it certainly is down to whether that person is is able to to take to take direction and and, and you know, bend away from their original idea of what the character is. If, if the director thinks it's not quite, you know, some people hit it straight off. And but it's but it, you, you do get a sense. I mean, the other thing is the, the the truth of it is, you almost know when someone comes through the door if they're right for a role. There's that. There's that. That is a that is a real truism actually. And it's just something about them and something that you you, you know you've gone through a short list and you you're maybe expecting or sometimes it works the opposite you're expecting someone who you think might be absolutely bang on and they come through the door and, and actually in the, in the flesh they're not they're not that person and it's just a ke pure chemistry thing um, mm -hmm. and it, again one should leave auditions and kind of go as long as I've done my best as long as I've acquitted myself in the best possible way and I've done the work as, to the best of my ability and then you just have to let it go and then yeah. if you get the job then fantastic but don't beat yourself up if you don't because because the chances are, you know, that the percentage is, is, you know, of, of not getting it are higher than of getting it in, in, in many respects. So, 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 yeah, just remember that thing of, I think, going in and, and thinking they want me to be the person, the right person for this. It's, 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 it's important. And uh, you mentioned uh, that, correct my, uh, is it performance capture now, not motion capture you re refer right. to? Yeah. So we've got a lot of questions about uh, performance capture. We've got one from um, uh, Harry Walker, one of our one of our members. And he says, um, what advice uh, would you give to any young actor wanting to try and get into motion capture? And how, how what methods and techniques should you be learning as an actor to be able to, to perform uh, uh, performance, um, performance capture to, to the best of your ability? Uh, good question. Um, so there's two answers to that, Harry. One, the first one is um, I've always believed that performance capture acting is is no different to any other form of of, uh, of acting, whether it's theatre acting or screen acting. You're, you're creating a character. You're uh, imbuing that character with uh, you know a, a huge amount of work that you've done on the psychology, the, the emotional centre of the character, the uh, the the physicality, um, it's it's you, you do all of that work with performance capture. Um, what you don't have is you don't have any external stimuli, so you don't have costume, you don't have makeup, you don't have any of those things. You're wearing a suit which is got markers <laughs> all over it, and you have marks all over your face, and you're wearing a head-mounted camera. So. Um, if you look at uh, the films that I've worked on, I mean, I've tended to play with performance capture. There are a few human characters that I play. Um, in video games, actors are getting the opportunity to play more human characters. Uh, but in, in films, they tended to be more uh, out there uh, creatures or creatures with that are humanoid in some way, or like Caesar in, in, in the ape sequence. So you're you're doing you're doing. So there is amount, an, an amount of physical work that you would specifically do. I mean, if you're obviously if you're playing an ape, you have to learn about ape behavior, especially in the ape sequence films that we did. They were sort of super involved apes because of the the drug that was uh, you know, enhancing their intelligence. So again, that was another level of of, of working on, on a character. It's that's how how within the, the progress of the three films, how the apes learn to speak, how you know physically, how does that work? How does that make your voice sound, and so on and so forth? Um, but but the actual idea of performance capture is as as long as you've got two actors who are looking into each other's eyes. You know there was there was you know many years ago a sort of um, uh, an almost a prejudice, but like the, the act. I remember in, in, in the early days, uh, you know, if you were an actor in costume and makeup, you got treated very differently to if you were in a performance yeah. capture with markers and head mounted camera because people thought well these are the proper actors and these are the I don't know really what you are actually but you're sort of, kind of <laughs> wearing a weird sort of thing um, you know and 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 actually that has been overcome now performance capture is, is very very central and mainstream in terms of the industry mm -hmm. um, and and so 
so so I suppose to answer your question um, and how do you get experience is you having that experience if you're an actor you've got that experience when, when we were doing Mowgli and we had a great cast in Mowgli we had Blanchett and Christian Bale and Benedict Cumberbatch and Amy Harris and your own son who played Boot who did brilliantly in that in that film and, and Boot and, yep Louis who played Boot and when we did the read through and everybody sat around the table and everybody asked that question what's the secret of performance capture acting and I said there isn't a secret you are creating character you if you're playing a panther Christian Bale you are you know you obviously um you know, it, it, it's you do the research and you know how a panther is and behaves and moves, and you might watch certain um, and observe certain things about the, the, the panther's face and how how that you know how breathe, how the breathing works or whatever. But ultimately, you're playing Bagheera. You're playing a panther, not yeah. panthers in general. You're not you're not generalizing. You know, it comes all the time. All the time, it comes back to character. Mm -hmm. And I just um sorry you just the, the microphone just went dead slightly there Andy so I'm, right. I'm gonna uh, no so I'm gonna elaborate because there's a question from Michael Wood and I think you just part answered it there but um just if you could answer again uh, Michael asks how do you develop the mindset of the animals that you portray and uh, you might have answered before but your microphone just cut off there <laughs> yeah. okay no so so it's it is it's all about as I say it's it's character creation in a very conventional sense it's 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 rather than being generic uh, about you know I'm playing an ape, I'm playing a chimpanzee. Okay, who is this chimpanzee? What is the backstory? What is the, you know, for instance, with Caesar, I very much played him because he was brought up by human beings. I always imagined that Caesar thought of himself as a human being in an ape's skin and therefore being an ape was alien to him. So again, he was he was outside of, of what he should be. And in fact, in his early formative years, Caesar thinks, yeah, he thinks himself to be human he's, and then reflects human behavior. And then when he's put into the sanctuary in the first movie in, in Rise, the Planet of the Apes, uh, you know, and is suddenly confronted with, with all these other chimpanzees and bonobos and orangutans and gorillas, he's like, he feels, he feels totally naked and an outsider. And so it's, so you, you find the human connection. You're, you are anthropomorphizing these these creatures. You are ascribing human emotion, feeling, thought, uh, intelligence to you know somehow crossing a Venn diagram of uh, my Venn diagram here. This is me. <laughs> yeah, this is the character, and and you you know at some point you cross you cross over, and it's that little you know crossing over point which becomes the character, and sometimes. Um, the character is further away from you, and sometimes the character is is much closer to you. And as Caesar evolved throughout the course of the three films, he he actually became me. He actually became closer to my experiences. And the last film is very much about death and grieving and revenge. And you know, and so I had to make it very personal to how I would feel if I was going through that. Um, and also, and because Caesar has evolved to that point. Excellent. And. Um, Someone's asking here, it's quite an interesting question actually from Michael Way. It's a bit, a bit of a curveball for you. It says, how do you deal with the mental strain of working on mega franchises with fan expectations? <laughs> um, boy, you, you kind of almost have to forget all of that. You know, you're, at the end of the day, for instance, um, well, any 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 of the characters I played in things that people know and love and uh, you know you just have to kind of go this is my interpretation of the character this is this is what I believe the character is you you can't really compare again you compare yourself to the previous version of whatever it is. you know if, you know if, if you know I'm sure Christian Bale didn't compare himself to whoever played Batman before him who was it George Clooney probably before him I can't remember or was it. Yeah. Okay, anyway, but uh, but you, you or, or you, you you can't even think about any of that. You're there to tell this particular story in at this particular time with this director and these other actors, and 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 you do and you create your own reality. You create your own um, um, emotional center for for the, your version of Spider-Man or you know Ulysses Claw or whoever it is that you're playing. And, and, and uh, brilliant, thank you. And uh, also, we've had quite a lot of people asking us, um, uh, quite a few directors actually, asking how do you go about doing motion capture on a low budget? I, is there a way to go about doing it on a low budget? There, there is, there is. Um, you have to cut your cloth. I mean, the, the thing about, before, what's great about performance capture is um, 
Well, it's, it's, it's about being able to play an entire scene out. Well, there's different, there's, 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 let me put this better. You know, if you're shooting on a live location, you have to be quite strict about exactly what you want to shoot um, to do it on a budget. If you're doing a completely CG environment and CG characters, you, know, you have the luxury of being able to run scenes in their entirety, and I think that's the best way of working, where you where you get the energy of a whole scene, and you're not, you know, it's very unlike conventional filmmaking, where of course you're breaking down, you're doing a close-up, you're doing, you're doing the master, you're doing the, you know, the coverage. Um, it, it, you can allow a whole scene to play out in its entirety and then and then the actors can go away and, and then you can then plot your camera moves with a virtual camera and that's a very efficient time efficient and uh, um, you know a, a way of making cg characters in a cg environment when you're shooting on set i think storyboarding is, is you have to be absolutely clear about um because of rendering costs. It's really about motion capture itself or performance capture itself. The actual capturing of the data and all of that isn't that expensive. It's, it actually is all about the rendering. So it's working out very cleverly and you know, the performance is the seconds that you that you want to convert into renders. That's that's where the that's where you have to cut your clock. I can imagine the servers that you guys have are, are quite extensive to be able to do, do all that. Um, where can a young actor or a young filmmaker go in the UK to, to learn more about motion capture? Uh, I know that you've you, you've done a few projects yourself. Is there any way they yeah, can? Yeah, we do. I mean, we, the Imaginarium, is, you know, we, we have a, a sort of a troupe now of, of actors that uh, that have been with us over the years and they come back and we've brought them in for projects and, and we, we you know we'll we'll try and increase our we need to do another round of auditioning really um to get a new I'm sure there's a lot of our members who would be interested in in auditioning yeah that. yeah well we, we, we'll we'll try we'll maybe talk about that and try and set something up um but but there are there are more and more universities and colleges that have their own um, facilities now. I mean, when I started, you know, when I started, and the reason the Imaginarium started was because I was directing a video game that, um, that, that, in fact, when it came to shooting it, they, we, the, the technology didn't exist in this country, so I had to go all the way back to New Zealand to shoot it, and this was in 2004, 2005, you know, and it was ridiculous because the cameras were made up in Oxford and, and the software was from Cambridge, and yet we were traveling to travel halfway across the world because there wasn't the infrastructure. But now there are lots of, I mean, there are lots of colleges, there are, um, and, and places, you know, ter places of, you know, of tertiary education, film schools, et cetera, who actually have their own virtual, uh, who, who are really invested in, you know, video game production. And so I think I think it's maybe finding a, a film school that's, that's the, that, that is doing, if you want to act in some of their projects, you know, or, or I know Plymouth, um, I think they've got a big motion. We, uh, we've employed a lot of people from Plymouth, right. uh, or, uh, and also Bournemouth as well, film school. Because it's just getting bigger and bigger. This industry. Do you see it? Is it has it peaked yet, or do you think it's going to keep on going? Well, it doesn't seem to be. And I mean, there, there are new organisations um, for um, that are starting out. That Eric Eric, um, uh, Eric uh, Fellner and Tim Bevan from Working Title have just started this new academy. You know, there seem to be academies that are for not not just for people in front of the camera, but predominantly for crafts based uh, learning. You know, I mean, like learning, not even directing or writing or producing, but but literally learning the craft of filmmaking and 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 aspects of filmmaking, including performance capture, um, that, that are starting to really come up because it's one of our it's one of our great exports. We have hugely oh, talented people. Because a lot of people think that the film industry, uh, or a lot of parents, I mean, I know that you had parents yourselves who sort of discouraged, uh, not necessarily discouraged, but maybe didn't understand the film industry, but it's actually one of the fastest growing industries in the UK at the moment, and it's, uh, it's a fantastic place to be. What would you say to any young person who's maybe trying to convince uh, their, 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 their loved ones or their parents that this is an exciting industry to, to get into? Well, I mean, the thing is, uh, when I was growing up, it was it was like get a proper job, you know. And there is no such thing now as a proper job, you know. The whole notion of work has changed so much, um, you know, from from the set sort of, uh, you know, uh, working working in education or working in a factory or working, you know, that there's so work is such much more tran transient and fluid, and people work in all sorts of different arenas. They don't just do one job for life anymore. They don't they don't 
it's just a completely different world. So, so it's no. I mean, the argument my parents gave me was, "It's so. How can you make money out of becoming an actor? And how can you survive?" And they they were concerned, I suppose, and rightly so. They were my parents. They, that's their job. Um, <laughs> you know, and I've got kids of my own now, and I will be thinking the same. But, um, but actually, it is. It is uh, as as you know. It's 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 walking a tightrope as much as any other job. All all jobs are flaky and and here today and gone tomorrow in many ways so i don't think there's that stigma attached to it as much mm -hmm. okay and uh somebody's asked here actually it's quite an interesting question uh, about you as a, as a director uh brian uh, ditchborn asked and said when did you know you were ready to direct and take on that direct first directing project of your own um I, I i suppose when i started to make my own shorts and short films um, and you know I've written uh, a few things and had stories to tell I think it's as much, as much about that as anything else because because when you start out and you want to become a director it's, it's because you're passionate about a particular tale that you want to tell and it's something that really that something that you've read or something you've seen or something that's angered you or something that's you know, made you laugh or something you know whatever it is it's, it's something that you feel that you've got to share um, so I, I think that must have been around, um, I suppose, yeah, kind of the late, late 90s, I suppose, when I started to really think that, that, that I was, right. um, yeah, it was scripts, a story that I really wanted to tell. And in fact, I was, did a full length feature script in 97, I think, 98, knowing that I was ready to, to, to direct that. So, what areas of career do you do you enjoy the most? And do you enjoy the directing? Is it the mo is it the performance capture? Is it the acting? What what areas the, the really it's sort of it's, it's, truly, it's, truly, it's truly everything. And um, you know, I love being on set, directing, working with the actors, sitting behind the monitor, watching the scenes come together. I love the the what I don't like is the development side of it. That that drives me nuts because your know, development hell is true. It is hell because you've and got. And is that getting your film financed? Yeah, is that yeah, trying well, to get you off the project, off off the ground? You, you, when yeah, you're talking about part of the process is the toughest, and that's when you really have to have nerves of steel and patience, huge patience. And projects can take years, years and years, and you have to have the same belief in them when you start. At, when you have the idea, when you think this would make a great movie, to imagine ten years later when you're going to be making it, because it's some of them can take that long, not all. Some, you know, five three four maybe if you're lucky but you know it's a huge huge investment in your life it's a huge part of your life and, and when you're starting out that doesn't you know necessarily mean anything but when you get to my age and you start to think okay well how many films you know you add up the amount of time it takes to make a film how many films have I got you know it, honestly you start to think like that because they are such a huge kind of uh, investment but um, so, so development is a really tricky time, and and financing and getting everybody to come on board. But the the most enjoyable parts, are, I, I love every aspect of filmmaking, apart from that, being on set, as I say, with the actors, and then and then the editing process is absolutely brilliant. When you've done all of that, you've been out, you've you've gathered all your raw materials, and now you're crafting the film, and which the story's finding itself in a different way, and um, and then and then the scoring and the music and the, you know all of that I love. Equally, I love just playing a character, just having the freedom to climb inside a role and really physically, mentally sink myself into that and, and not have the distraction of anything else. And they're just different, you know, and, and, and again, it could be on stage, it could be it could be on camera, it doesn't matter. It's, that's, it's just the praxis, it's the doing of it, it's the being in the moment and thinking that whatever you're doing in that moment, you will, you know, you will try and achieve the best possible results. Sure. And, and just and just it is it's being in the moment truly living on the edge and, and, and being in it's really really good andy to hear you say this because for our members who, who struggle to get just the film out out there to hear from somebody of your caliber saying it can take four years um it, it's, it's really really uh, it's really good advice because actually that a lot of our young filmmakers uh, come to us and say i've got this great idea but i just can't get it off the ground but it sounds like it's the same at the top as well as being at the bottom it's it is the industry it is i mean 
there are hundreds of production companies around the land, you know, who are who have got slates of films that they're trying to make, and and all of which are great, probably great ideas. It's just it's just the zeitgeist as much as anything. It's just like is this film, you know, some films that you you have the idea about, you think, oh, this would be so great to make, and then it can sit on a shelf for ten years, and then suddenly the moment is for now. We've been trying to make Animal Farm for. I love you, a great film. I think um, it's about seven or eight years or longer actually seven or eight wow. years maybe nine years that we've had the rights for animal farm and we've been trying to make and finally it looks like we are going to be shooting oh, that's brilliant that's brilliant and and it's it, it it just takes that time and actually thinking about it there couldn't be a better time to make animal farm because it's so relevant and it's yeah. so much about now and and uh, about greed and and corruption and the loss of innocence and you know so it's so it's um it's it, it, you know so they sort of find their moment films. Mm -hmm. so we're gonna have to wrap up uh, in a second but i've got to ask you this question because my mum, who was a great massive massive david bowie fan and you played alongside david bowie yourself what was the man like and what was it like to to play alongside david <laughs> he he was Amazing. I mean, he's you know he was a huge hero of mine, I was, and, and to work with him was was a real career highlight. I mean, so we did a film together called The Prestige, and he was playing Tesla, Nikolai Tesla, the, the amazing uh, scientist who created um, alternating current. And uh, you know, uh, he, he's just and, and David was. I mean, Chris Nolan, very bold, extraordinary piece of casting. Um, and I was I was playing his his sort of uh, assistant uh, Ali who um, who who basically yeah they're, 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 so we spent, had all our scenes together and he was hilarious he was had a great sense of humour he was a great very great actor he had to do a Serbian accent uh, to play Nikolai Tesla and he kept saying to me Andy I think uh, I think I, I sound a little bit like Inspector Clouseau is that is that is, does it sound like Cluzo? He, and uh, so he, he, he was very humble. And um, there was lots of scenes. We had these scenes with, I don't know if you've seen the movie, but there are scenes with um, that revolve around cats and these black cats who get um, get turned into who are re, re, you know who are. Well, I won't give it away. Actually, it'll spoil the story for those of you who haven't seen it. But see it anyway. There's lots of scenes of cats and. Um, and he couldn't keep a straight face. He was a terrible corpser and very, 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 very funny to be on set with. And we did struggle to get through some of the scenes. Brilliant. Well, I'm glad I asked that for my mum. I know she's not quite in the age of 16 to 25, but you know, it's been brilliant, Andy, speaking to you. And I, I just want to finish off on something which I'm sure you won't mind uh, speaking about. You, you've you talked about uh, storytelling, the passion of storytelling and the why and the vision and why this has got you into film. And, uh, and, I, uh, and I think... Um, we, we talked about Medi Cinema, and uh, I didn't expect to say this at the end of this thing, but Medi Cinema are a company that obviously uh, work uh, in, uh, they have they have cinemas and hospitals, and you're, you're quite right, they could be someone's first movie, the last movie, but that power of story is the reason why we're all working in film, and, I, and as an ambassador now, um, I, I, hopefully we can finish this conversation on a really positive thing. I was just wondering if you could say anything about Medi Cinema and why our listeners, are, we're going to put this online as well, why sh people should support that organisation. Yeah, I mean, Medi Cinema is just is one of those charities that totally, totally makes sense. It's a, on, on a very profound level. Um, I, I'm so proud to be associated with them now. And, and, and in fact, Louis, my son, who, who you know, we, we went uh, two weeks ago to St. Thomas's Hospital, uh, and he, I introduced him and, and Q&A'd Louis as he was talking about The Kid Who Would Be King, which is the movie that's just come out. And, and to meet the children who... You know, some of whom are going through horrendous uh, experiences, and they're they're taken away from their homes, from their families. They're on their own. Um, some of some families living miles away and can't even get to them. And to have a, once a week to be able to take them off the ward, you know, where where you very quickly become institutionalised in hospital and very quickly forget you and and how you feel and what normality is to have the experience of going and sitting and communicating through with other uh, you know um, patients sitting there and and just being taken into the world of a film is so uh, so uplifting for them and it, it really does mean everything it means such a lot because you're 
when you think about time and the telescoping of time, which is what film does, you're able to give these children, or you know, patients, not just children, you're able to give them multiple lives. You know, they're, they're sitting there, and the day-to-day -day of just getting through, uh, getting through, not being able to think, I mean, yes, they can watch the television at the end of their bed, and maybe, or maybe not, but, but, but the sharing of that experience, and, and have these, these two-hour slots where they can, can have that cathartic experience with other people, and, and live lots of lives, is, is, a, is, a, is a really great gift, and it's something that we can all do. Uh, yeah. you know, in the film industry, and so so, I'm absolutely thrilled to be to be able to to be part of it. Brilliant! And I think everyone listening, well, obviously, if you go and check what they're doing, it's it's brilliant. It's an organisation that we, as the National Youth Film Academy, support fully, and I think they've got an incredible ambassador in yourself as well, uh, working for the Mandy. So, um, um, that's great. So, so yeah, um, so that's the end of our session. I, I could talk to you forever. It's been uh, about Bowie. We've heard about your mountain, uh, your climbing career, and how it's ended up being one of the most world. I'm actually, going to, I'm actually going to Everest Space Camp next week, so you caught oh, me up. <laughs> oh well, well. Hopefully, uh, it's a successful uh, <laughs> climb for you, uh, and because uh, we do want to be seeing uh, Animal Farm in the future. So please don't put yourself <laughs> to uh, any danger. But Andy, uh, it, it's been an absolute pleasure speaking to you on behalf of the members um, um, to hear your story and to hear how this, the struggles at the top are still the same as the struggles at the bottom. But if you just keep a vision and you just just do what you love doing that's telling a story then then you, you're likely to to go out and make your own work and hopefully uh, work for people to enjoy so thank you so much for your time and uh, hopefully you get to, to speak to you soon all right thank you very much thank you. i just want to say good luck to everybody and stick in there you know and enjoy it have fun that's the most important thing have a really good time doing what you do it's a great Brilliant. job to all right Cheers. thank you so much Andy. take care bye bye, bye.